So welcome to part C, or the third part of chapter one, and we're going to talk about work of breathing here. And I think this is a, a good part, or a good um, place for this uh, topic, because it flows nicely from the Campbell diagram, which was introduced in the first two sections of this chapter, uh, where we discussed, respectively, the static and dynamic aspects of intrathoracic pressure. Now, work of breathing is not a direct mechanical mediator of heart-lung interaction, which, as I've mentioned before, is really the thesis of this, all these lectures and the written volume. Uh, but work of breathing certainly uh, affects gas exchange, oxygen utilization, uh, which can uh, obviously affect myocardial performance. The work of breathing also explains some respiratory patterns that are seen in the intensive care unit in patients in the ED or on the floor who are in extremis. The work of breathing also flows nicely from the Campbell diagram because it's uh, depicted as the area under the curve of the lung and chest wall elastance curves. Um, so while it may not be a direct mechanical mediator as intrathoracic pressure is or lung volume is, um, it is work of, work of breathing is an important concept and I think is a good place to be discussed here. So this next slide is a little bit nerdy, um, but it's basically just proof that you can use the area under the pressure volume curve uh, that is the that, that was illustrated or is illustrated on the Campbell diagram as a uh, um, uh, marker of of work. Uh, and again, the Campbell diagram is intrathoracic or pleural pressure on the x-axis and, and thoracic volume on the y-axis. So <clears throat> basically some high school physics here. The, the unit of work is joules and work requires energy and work, as you may or may not recall, is defined as a force multiplied by a distance. <clears throat> so this is work equals force times distance. Now, because pressure is a force exerted over a given area, that is, pressure equals force over area, you may see where I'm going here, but you could rearrange this equation, that is, force equals pressure multiplied by area. And because volume is an area over a distance, uh, so that is volume, and that when, I mean, when I say over here, I do not mean divided by, but an area multiplied by a given distance. Um, now you can rearrange this equation for distance equals volume over area, and then you can essentially plug this back into here and this back into here. Then the work required to expand a three-dimensional object is the integral of the pressure required to change a given volume. And so that's basically a fancy way of saying that the area under the pressure volume curve is uh, equal to the work required um, to expand a three-dimensional object. So back to the Campbell diagram, what is the work required to expand the lung and only the lung here based off of this um, pulmonary compliance or elastance curve? Well, it's the work, uh, this is the work required to expand the lung from FRC, which is roughly 35% of vital capacity to 50% of the vital capacity. It's the area under this curve. Um, uh, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, so you could apply the same reasoning to uh, the chest wall, but the chest wall is a little bit different here because um, as we saw in the first part of this chapter, that the equilibrium volume of the chest wall is actually higher than FRC. Remember the equilibrium volume, going back here, the equilibrium volume of the lung is actually lower than FRC. So you actually have to perform work on the lung to get to FRC, and then you have to perform this additional pocket of work on the lung to get from FRC to 50% vital capacity. Now the chest wall is a little bit different because the, as you can see, the equilibrium volume is actually much higher than FRC and even higher than most normal tidal volume uh, breaths. So there's actually, 
um, work required to compress the chest wall from its equilibrium volume to functional residual capacity. So this is stored work in the chest that as you increase for, uh, your FRC, as you increase your thoracic volume from FRC to say 50% vital capacity, this stored work that is used to compress the chest actually facilitates expansion of the chest wall. Um, it's, it's kind of a transition of uh, potential energy to kinetic energy. Now that changes above the equilibrium volume of the chest wall. Once you get to volumes um, uh, up at, uh, in this range, then uh, work is actually required on the chest wall to expand the chest wall in addition to the work that is required to expand the lung. So that's essentially what I just said, that this is potential energy stored in the chest wall that facilitates a chest wall expansion um, because it's below its equilibrium volume. Uh, or sorry, as, as um, volumes below the equilibrium volume of the chest wall, the chest wall wants to expand outwards. So then what's the, the work on the static respiratory system? Well, as we saw, the area under the lung elastance curve was defined by um, this envelope here, okay? And then there's that work that is required to compress the chest wall, and that's defined by this envelope here, okay? So it's actually the work on the static respiratory system that must be done to expand the, the respiratory system from FRC to 50% vital capacity is actually defined by this blue triangle here, or the total amount of work required to expand the lung minus the amount of work that is used to compress the chest wall again because that the chest wall actually has a tendency to expand as um, volumes at volumes that are below the chest wall equilibrium volume. So the total static respiratory system work here to go from FRC to 50% vital capacity is defined by this blue triangle. And now you can see that I've also been color coding this lecture as even in the previous sections that blue has always indicated static pressure or static work. And you saw that in the bag and tube model of the lung, as well as in that insp inspiration animation I showed. The blue lines um, were, were representative of the um, static pressure, whereas the red lines, as you will see, or the red color, um, is used to represent dynamic work or dynamic pressure. So this is the work in joules required to expand the lungs from FRC here to 50% vital capacity. It's this triangular envelope. Okay, and then this is the work in joules required to compress the chest wall from its equilibrium volume to FRC, and this is potential energy. So there's a decrease in the amount of work required to expand the lung when it is coupled with the chest wall, and this is because there's potential energy stored in the chest wall as it is compressed from its equilibrium volume which I've said probably eight times now. So moving on to the dynamic aspects of um, work in the respiratory system, uh, in, in addition to the static uh, work required. And as I mentioned in the last slide, uh, there's this additional amount of work that must be uh, done to overcome the resistive elements of gas flow. There's also something known as uh, tissue resistance uh, and that is actually as the lung slides across the chest wall, there's actually energy lost as heat. And that's technically um, a type of dynamic pressure or dynamic work that is also added into the amount of work that is done to facilitate gas flow. But um, for the most part, it's a small amount of pressure and it's kind of ignored, but there is that additional kind of uh, resistive work that is part of the respiratory system. So this is the joules in work. Again, it's the area under the pressure volume curve that is uh, required to overcome the resistance of the respiratory system during an inspiration. And again, this is an inspiration from uh, an, an inspiration from FRC to 50% vital capacity in somebody with underlying underlying normal 
pulmonary elastins, chest wall elastins, and a normal um, dynamic uh, component to, to breathing, so normal airways resistance. Okay, so the total work performed by the respiratory system, the inspiratory muscles, is the blue shaded area, the static work, plus the red shaded area, which is the dynamic work. Then, as uh, we saw in previous sections, uh, in pa sometimes in patients who are having a hard time breathing, they may have increased airways resistance, they, they may be an active expiration rather than a passive one. Again, remember, passive expiration is contained within this work envelope, so that's actually not, passive expiration doesn't require any additional work, but if there's active expiration, then there is a curve that shifts out into the right and this additional area here would be um, the additional work required to overcome uh, flow resistance with a forced expiration. Okay, so what would this look like in a patient with decreased lung compliance? So what, what, what are some um, examples of decreased lung compliance? Well, alveolar edema in a patient who f who's just flashed or you know significant pulmonary ARDS um, you know to a certain extent diffuse alveolar hemorrhage um, chronic interstitial lung disease like um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or usual interstitial pneumonitis these are all disease processes that that you will see that shift the um, pulmonary elastance or compliance curve down into the left. So that's uh, illustrated by this curve here. This, this person has diseased lungs. Okay, so the decrease in lung compliance would lead to a very large increase in static work. Because now remember that it's the area between the pressure volume curve of the lung and the y-axis. So this would be a, a very large increase in static work of breathing and that's illustrated here. So what does the body do to try and compensate for this increased work of breathing, static work of breathing? Well, you've seen this frequently. The patients engage in rapid shallow breathing. So the shallow breathing minimizes this uh, static work load uh, imparted upon the respiratory muscles by the decreased lung compliance. The shallow breathing minimizes that work and in order to maintain minute ventilation the patient increases respiratory rate because remember your minute ventilation is respiratory rate multiplied by the tidal volume. Now this is a key um, piece of physiologic information that you must understand. Rapid shallow breathing may maintain minute ventilation, but it results in sometimes a dramatic drop in alveolar ventilation. So there's a, there's a distinction between minute ventilation, which is simply respiratory rate multiplied by tidal volume, and alveolar ventilation. Alveolar ventilation takes into, in, takes into consideration dead space. So alveolar ventilation is the minute ventilation multiplied by one minus the dead space. So as you rapid shallow breathe, your relative dead space fraction goes up and that's because your dead space is your um, anatomic dead space over your tidal volume. So as your tidal volume decreases from rapid shallow breathing, the anatomic dead space, the numerator, stays relatively constant. And so as you lower the denominator, if you're rapid shallow breathing, you are effectively increasing your dead space. And it, you can almost think of this as like a dog panting, um, that the rapid shallow aspect of the breathing lo lowers your alveolar ventilation despite maintaining a minute ventilation. And the lower alveolar ventilation will result in hypercapnia. It's an effective increase in dead space which drives up your carbon dioxide, your PaCO2. And you'll see this in patients with, say, fluid overload. And I frequently get this question from house staff saying, well, the, you know, the patient's hypercapnic. Why is that? 
And I say, well, because they're fluid overloaded and they're an alveolar edema. Well, that doesn't make any sense because, you know, in order to retain carbon dioxide, there's got to be, you know, a decrease in your alveolar ventilation or an increase in your dead space. Well, these patients are effectively increasing their dead space, and it's because they're rapid, shallow breathing. And in these patients, you can diurese away the hypercapnia. Um, and this is something that's been well known and documented in the literature since the, the 70s. There's, I believe, a paper in JAMA or in Annals that looks at hypercapnia in patients with fluid overload, and it gets better with diuresis. So it's, it's not a physiologic mystery that patients who are in fluid overload come in hypercapnic. So this is uh, a cartoon of, of how the patient compensates. This is rapid shallow breathing. So they're breathing at a much smaller volume, but they're going to increase their respiratory rate to to um, overcome the small tidal volume. Now I've demonstrated here that as they rapid shallow breathe, you can see the dynamic component um, of intrathoracic pressure has changed a little bit. And I'm going to discuss that in a few more slides. And this occurs because when you breathe at l lower lung volume, your airways resistance increases. And that's because, as I've discussed before, at higher lung volumes, the airways are tethered open. And so as you increase the radius of the airways, there's actually less resistance. But if you breathe at a lower lung volume, actually you increase airways resistance because the caliber of the airways decreases. So this is just an inherent um, consequence of low lung volume breathing. That is the dynamic work of breathing goes up because the area under this curve will increase. But the body accepts that. It's an it's a exchange for a lower elastic work of breathing. There's a smaller increase in the dynamic work of breathing. So what about uh, work with a decreased chest wall compliance? Well, I think you can imagine what's going to happen here. This is a cartoon of a decreased chest wall compliance, massive ascites, massive obesity, um, abdominal compartment syndrome, you, you, you can get the sense of what the underlying causes of decreased chest wall compliance are, but it shifts the chest wall compliance curve down into the right. So just like with a decrease in pulmonary compliance, uh, this will result in rapid shallow breathing to minimize the work of breathing. And that is um, uh, demonstrated by this cartoon here that the patient will again breathe at small smaller volumes to minimize what would be a very large increase in the static work of breathing and again the dynamic airways or the dynamic work of breathing has increased a little bit because of the increased airways resistance at lung at low lung volumes so this is the elastic work um, performed on the lungs and this is the elastic work performed on the chest wall during rapid shallow breathing. And then just one final note, in pure chest wall in a pure chest wall compliance abnormality, and by abnormality I mean a decrease in chest wall compliance, the pleural pressure does not tend to decrease. Um, remember that the pleural pressure tends to decrease when pulmonary compliance drops down into the left. There's requires a lower pleural pressure in order to um, drive a given volume. But clinically, that is in reality, decrements in chest wall compliance are frequently accompanied by a decreased pulmonary compliance. And I think you can appreciate why um, you know, a lot of these patients who have very poor chest wall compliance will have comorbid impairments in pulmonary compliance. For example, massive ascites causing a decreased chest wall compliance is often accompanied by um, excess lung water, which would tend to decrease pulmonary compliance as well. Okay, so I've already talked a little bit about this, but this rapid shallow breathing, um, you minimize the large changes in uh, pleural pressure with the rapid shallow breathing but it increases your effective dead space fraction. So this is your dead space fraction. This is the volume of your dead space, which is, includes your anatomic dead space, which is f essentially constant, and physiologic dead space, which can occur with things like pulmonary embolus, over your tidal volume. So you can see that if you shallowly breathe, you lower the denominator, your effective um, dead space fraction will go up, okay?
and increase in dead space fraction lowers alveolar ventilation. You may maintain minute ventilation, respiratory rate times tidal volume by, by the increase in, in respiratory rate, but you will lower alveolar ventilation. Alveolar ventilation is, is your minute ventilation, that is your respiratory rate times your tidal volume, multiplied by 1 minus the dead space fraction. And I also mentioned this as well, the low volume breathing favors higher airways resistance, which increases the dynamic work of breathing, and this is a, this is a trade-off. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, work with increased airways resistance. So I think you can predict what this graph is going to look like with increased airways resistance. There will be um, an increase in the curve to the left of the pulmonary elastance curve. This is the curve that defines uh, the, dynamic, uh, the dynamic work of breathing or the dynamic component of intrathoracic pressure. Um, that is required to overcome the inertial forces and drive gas flow. So it's the volume in this loop, and then this would be the loop done uh, with increased expiratory airways resistance on a forced expiration. Okay, so the body uh, compensates by breathing at a higher lung volume, and just as I mentioned before, lung volume profoundly affects the caliber of the airway. So if your primary problem is increased airways resistance, the way you tend to compensate is by breathing at a higher lung volume to tether open those airways and maintain that gas flow. Um, but there's a trade-off here. Just like rapid shallow breathing, there's a trade-off. You minimize elastic work of breathing, but, increased but you increase your dynamic work of breathing. At breathing at high lung volume, there's a lower dynamic work of breathing but at the higher lung volumes, there's an increased elastic work of breathing, and that's because at the higher lung volumes, there's a, a greater separation between the pulmonary and chest wall elastance curves, which means that the, that the pressure required to maintain um, thoracic volume is increased. Okay, and I, I mentioned this, that patients tend to breathe at the higher lung volumes when the primary problem is increased airways resistance. So. Um, take a moment, collect yourself. This, this slide's going to get pretty intense. Um, I really geeked out on this one. Uh, so, you know, you might have to take some propranolol or something to really uh, calm yourselves down before getting into this. But this is a Campbell diagram. So it's the x-axis here is still pleural pressure or intrathoracic pressure. The y-axis here is still um, thoracic volume in percent vital capacity, and this is your Campbell diagram with airways resistance. But coming out towards you on the z-axis is expiratory flow. So the um, x-z-axis will define um, the pressure flow relationship of the lung, okay? And this is expiratory flow. You could essentially make the same graph um, going inwards with flow and have um, inspiratory flow is graphed here, but that would just get completely out of hand and your head might explode. So this is going to illustrate the effect of lung volume on the pressure flow relationship. So this is, this red dotted line here is the pressure flow or the flow pressure relationship for high lung volume breathing. That's what this curve demonstrates here. And we saw some of this in, if this is confusing, you go back to part two of this chapter or part B, the um, dynamic aspects um, of, of intrathoracic pressure and review the pressure flow curve. It's, it's shaped like this because of changes in um, turbulent flow at higher expiratory flows. But in general, um, at a higher lung volume, there is a lower pressure required to generate a given flow, hence the slope of this curve. Okay, So then these other two curves are essentially the pressure flow relationship at a medium lung volume, and this is the pressure flow relationship at a very low lung volume. You can see at a low lung volume, you get a much smaller flow for a much higher intrathoracic pressure. And again, this is expiratory flow. 
Um, so the intrathoracic pressures on a forced expiration tend to be positive here, okay? High, medium, low lung volume pressure flow relationship. So as I've kind of already described for a given expiratory pleural pressure, let's just pick plus 10 centimeters of water, so 10 centimeters of, wa of water above atmospheric pressure, you can note the difference in flow between breathing at a high versus a low lung volume, and that'll be marked by this little dot here. So at 10, okay, the flow you're going to get, your expiratory flow that you're going to get if you're at a low lung volume is much diminished compared to the expiratory flow you would get if you were at a higher lung volume. So you can see that blowing out air uh, in a patient with uh, high airways resistance, it's beneficial to be at a higher lung volume because you're going to get a much better expiratory flow. And again, you could make the same mirror image pressure flow relationship for inspiration as well. Um, it will be beneficial to be at this higher volume. Okay. So at the higher lung volumes, the elastic work of breathing increases, but this is invested in decreased dynamic work of breathing and improved gas flow. Um, but the pleural pressure swings can still be quite profound. And that's illustrated by this. Um, you can see that the area between the elastance curves of the chest wall and the lung increase, so your elastic work of breathing has increased, but you've much decreased your dynamic work of breathing, comparing this curve to this curve. So this is um, a trade-off that the body accepts when your primary problem is um, airways resistance. So uh, you survived that graph. I uh, hope it made sense. Um, but thank you for tuning in to the third portion of chapter one, the work of breathing. Uh, the next portion of this chapter will turn to the Campbell diagram in mechanical ventilation. And I can assure you it's going to be just as exciting as the first three sections.